Um, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. And it's good to see uh, so many people at this presentation. Um, I've been here before in GCon. This is my first time. But I'm, I'm, I, I like a lot coming back here and see all of you. That's a very good thing. I really appreciate being here. Now, uh, but who am I? Just a quick introduction. I, I'm a developer, so I've been coding since 1988. Started in, in Ascender C and all the way through a lot of other languages. And in 2000, I started working with e XP. You know, not, not Windows, but you know, not e Windows XP, but the Agile method, uh, extreme programming. Uh, I co-founded Java Zoo Group Torino, which was a very successful, it is, these days, a very successful Java user group in Italy. And I was nominated Java champion in 2005. And I live in London, obviously because of the weather, because it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah whatever. Um, whenever you see something that you like, it would be great if you tweet about that, because that helps me. So whatever, if you see something you don't like, don't tweet. No, that's, that's what it is. But something you like, then please tweet. So if I suck, just, just be quiet. <laughs> but if you like me in any way, just, just drop a tweet, will be good. A tweet will be good. All right? Um, so the agenda of today, today we're going to talk about distributed programming in general. And we're going to, because it's a so, such a, a big topic, we're going to focus on a very specific thing, which is the CAP theorem, which is also very good for your CV, because uh, interview-wise. Because if you go to an interview, and somebody asks you about that, or about distributed programming, if you know the CAP theorem, that would be great. So it's absolutely something that you want to take note of. So if you have, a, uh, I will tell you, you know, even the small bits you want to capture, so that interview-wise, you will be OK. All right, you will be able to tell something that will impress uh, the person that you will interview. But of course, then you can go down and go deep and, and uh, you know and understand anything. But yeah, we will see the cap Turing explained with demos and code. So we will see uh <coughs> we will see basically uh, live demos when we have uh, uh, some servers that will build a key value store, a replicated key value store, and we'll see what happens when the network goes down, when the server gets killed, and you know how they react to these events and how they guarantee that you know, the data is somehow still readable. No? Which not always happen with some databases, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. And there are three main mechanisms uh, that uh, implements the CAP theorem, if you want. And we're going to see all three of them. Now, and then maybe we have some time for a QA, but this is originally a very long presentation, so I have to cut it. So I probably have one minute for questions. <laughs> So, I, and even no question is good, so no problem. All right. Um, first, do we need distributed programming? Well, if you have one of these, you may not need it. This is the biggest computer ever built. It's in China. It has 93 petaflops, uh, 93 trillion of uh, trillions, so million, billions, trillions, 93,000, sorry, trillion uh, of operation per second capacity. And it has 10.5 million cores. It has 41,000 nodes and runs on Linux. So, uh, so if you have one of these in your bedroom, then you probably don't need distributed programming. You are kind of OK. You, you can deal with that. However, uh, not everybody can afford this. And also, there are not a lot of one. A lot um, no, no, not a lot of many of these things. They're just one at the moment, maybe two. So they're kind of difficult to buy. So you may want to go in a different direction. And that's the reason why you want to have distributed programming. With distributed programming, you basically deal with two problems, storage and computation. So instead of having a big computer, you have a lot of small computers. And you distribute your CPU load across those computers, one problem. And you distribute your storage across all those computers, second problem. So, and the thing is, well, how do we deal with scale? So how do we do when we add more computers? And how do we manage it? And uh, how do we you know, figure out, oh, this, this million of computers should look like one. How do I handle that? 
And that's where distributed programming com comes in place. And in this presentation, we look at the storage problem, not computation, storage. So we're not going to talk about map per use or something like that. We're going to talk about storage. How do we deal with storage? And the storage must have three different, well, three basic properties. Of course, they're different. Uh, scalability, availability, and consistency. So let's have a look at those. Hmm? I have to introduce you this concept because then are relevant when we look at the code. <laughs> so it would be a bit boring, but it's OK. So scalability is the ability that the system uh, is able to cope with increasing load. No? So many users, many more users are coming, and the system scales. So somehow the system grow, the system grow its size and is able to accommodate more requests. Okay? So that's basic property of distributed system these days. So you cannot have a static one that will never grow. That you have to accommodate growth. That's scalability. Uh, of course, there are different concepts related to scalability. So we have. Um, size scalability, the one we just saw. Geographic scalability, you have you know things in different servers, and you know administrative scalability. So whenever you want to scale, yeah. For example, yesterday, no, two days ago, a friend of mine who was working in a bank, he told me that whenever they need to have a new cluster, they pick up the phone, and they call India. Hello, I'm gonna need a few machines here. Yeah, how many? How many? Uh, like 20 more, please. OK. And then after uh, three months, they have the machines. So that's not what you want, OK? You want to be very, 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 very fast. And he's solving that problem, so, uh, which is quite easy, so he put something else. But, um, but when I talk about administrative scalability, I'm talking about that, the ability no, without doing phone calls, really. So everything should be automatic these days. Now, how do we scale? So how do we manage? How do we splash these big data sets in our servers? Well, usually we slice them in vertical data sets. And then what we do, we start from this situation where we have a big database, for example, three data sets, and we create three databases with one data set each. No? This is very good because it, it improves performance because those are three different servers, and they will be faster than going through the big Bug, big thing here. And, and also, if something fails, only a portion of it will fail, not everything. Okay? However, yeah, there is still the problem of the failure, you know? So if I really want to get to the, you know, the green ones, no? and suddenly that server fails, my access to that data is completely gone. So I partition the data, of course, but then I have to deal with the problem of, you know, what if one fails? And even worse, what if it, it becomes slow or, or unresponsive? Or maybe, you know, it's on the other side of a pond, like in Australia, and, you know, the speed of light is a bitch, and you cannot really do anything about that? No? You, you, have you ever talked to a product manager that doesn't understand? I mean, ever happened to you? You talk to somebody and they do not understand this concept. You know, look, here, there are thousands and thousands of kilometers to reach Chicago from China. It cannot be instantaneous. The speed of light is a problem. You know, Newton, those things, you know, traveling time, all this bullshit. You have to figure it out. So it's important that there are problems that, you know, I have to deal with. So how do you do with that? So the user solution is to copy, no? the same data on multiple machines. So rather than having a vertical slice data set on one single machine, each machine hosts a couple of them. No? So for example, you see each data set is replicated in this example on two different machines. That's very useful because even if one machine fails, I mean, you're still able to query all the database, assuming you are writing some clever code on top of that, but it's not complicated. So you still have the data you still know how to access the data in another instance. So whenever, sorry, whenever instance fails, you don't have a problem. However, you, there is another problem, which is keeping in sync these data sets. Okay? Now, imagine that we have, uh, we are in this situation. So we, 
we, we, we, have, we have a situation where, you know, one data set gets desynchronized, so it's slightly older. If I query that data set, I'm getting the wrong information, and that's not cool, especially if it's about something very even interesting like you, your money or, you know, things that we care about. There's going to be a problem, no? Because in that situation, the green and the red are completely synchronized, unsynchronized, sorry. So we need to find a way to deal with that. And that's where the concept of consistency came from, okay? So your database must be consistent. It should not be in this state or, well, that's drill through. So consistency is about uh, that if I access any data at any point in time, I get the last value that was written about that data. So I'm not in a situation when I get an old value, a stale value, no value. I'm not in that situation. This is called strong consistency. And it means that every single client using your system has the exact same view, same view of the data. Okay? And it's a very important uh, uh, characteristic. You really want, want to have it again. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. And again, there are this that I talk about was called strong consistency. No? So uh, every replica sees the same update in the same order. No? And not two replicas can have different value on different time. However, there is also other kind of consistencies that sometimes are very good. Well, usually are the one that distributed systems are using. One is weak consistency. So in weak consistency, every replica sees every update, but not in the correct order. You see, what, what's worth it? Well, it can be worth it. So if you are, for example, uh, well, get, let's get to the bank account. It doesn't really work like that, but just give you an example that can be understood. No? In the bank account, you, you, can store, you can store the balance, which is a solid value. Or you can store the sequence of events that brought you to have that balance. So I deposit 200 and I withdraw 100, so I can compute the balance is 100. Okay? And, you know, it's independent for the balance. It's completely independent if I first withdrawn or I first uh, deposited. The balance would still be 100. So if I have, you know, all the data uh, in terms of uh, every update, but even in different orders, that's okay. But unfortunately, most of the database, we cannot really build that way, okay? So what we usually try to do when we build a distributed system is we build eventual consistency, which is funny. So eventually, you know, some point in time, you will see the same data. And the trick is establish a time frame which is small enough, so you don't have to wait one year to get the, the information that you want, all right? And, uh, you know, that's, that's very important. So many of the databases that we're going to see are working with this model, on the eventual consistent model. Um, talking about that, it's also important to discuss availability. So there's not it's not really important if we have this fantastic database and then it's not available. So if something, like we saw before, something fails, the database stops working or start giving uh, wrong results, that's not good. So our system must be also available, so be able to give us consistent results continuously without any kind of big issues, even if it, this, the, the system, one of the systems goes down. Hmm? So before that, um, do you know what's the best example of a distributed system nowadays? It's, it's Google. So Google builds a lot of distributed systems. So they have the biggest database Im Im that you can imagine. Think about only Gmail. How do they do that? So you, you, you know, how, how many of you have a Gmail account? I do. Well, all of you. <laughs> how do they do that? Because they have this gigantic database distributed on a lot of servers and replicated across all these servers. And the trick is they, you know, they started building their own hardware. Because it's not important if you use a, a correct distributed 
programming, it's not really important if one of those servers goes down. Your data is replicated and kept in sync in other 20 servers. So they started building their own hardware. So instead of buying racks, they build their own racks, super cheap, with very, very cheap hardware. Uh, be not because they are cheap, they are not cheap, they have a shit lot of money, but because they, they, they care, they don't really care at that scale if one or two or ten or hundred servers go down. Yeah, we're going to spin up a thousand, who cares? Now that's the spirit, you know? Really, uh, you, know, we don't, you don't really have this, this, this petaflop machine. Just have a million of, you know, just cheap machine, dollar, hundred dollar each one, and you know, whatever. I, I, can, I can stomp on them, everything will be good, right? Now, the CAD theorem, uh, now, have a look. So, it has three properties. It takes in consideration three pro properties. The first is consistency, we saw that before, okay? Consistency, availability, we saw that before, so your system must be always available, is able to respond. And then, the third one is the tricky one, partition tolerance. So those are the three axes of the CAD theorem. What is, the partition, what is partition tolerance? It means that your system still behaves, still works in some way, even in when a network partition happens. So the classic Godzilla uh, go into the ocean and, and you know, bites the, the cable between USA and Europe, and your distributed system keep going. Magic, no? This is partition tolerance. And the CAP theorem says that, you know, you cannot have all three. When you consider consistency as strong consistency, the, the first one that we, s we, we saw, you cannot have all three. So we got just select two of them. And this has been mathematically proven. I'm not here trying to bullshit you. There's a, there's a mathematical proof, and any people that says, oh, we debunked it, it's, it's all BS, because, because you can debunk it only if you say, okay, it's not really consistency, it's weak consistency, or some other form of consistency, or oh, it's not really availability, it's the, well, some availability. So you only can have two, okay? And there are three ways, three different uh, uh, composition of this. So we have CA system, which they say the network will never fail, okay? Never. And those are classic RDBMS, classic databases that use protocol like the two-phase commit. So the network will never fail, we're going to be all right. And this is a very strong assumption because network fails. I mean, it uh, happened a couple of times in different jobs that, I mean, the, the, cleaning, uh, um, the, the cleaning guys go into the server room, trip on a cable, and instantly half of your servers are down, disconnected, whatever. Th that's super common. So network partition happen. A system goes down. The, 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 the magical router that guarantees uh, for eternal functioning fails. And your network gets partitioned, segmented in two, three, four pieces. In that situation, this CA system cannot work. Okay? And those are classical strict, they're called strict quorum protocol. So when I, I, when I save a value, Everybody, every node must agree on this operation. So we all have to agree that that's it. Okay, we are good. We saved that value, all of us. Strict quorum. Then we have AP system. AP systems are funny. They say, yeah, you know what? Consistency? Yeah, we don't really care. Nah. And, and there are, look, there are really good business uh, decisions for that. It's not that you never have consistency. But when something happens, the system sacrifices consistency. So for a certain amount of time, you will have different data on the database. And that's cool. For example, that's how Amazon Dynamo works. What is the business use case of that? So think about you going on Amazon, and, uh, you, know, and, uh, and you cannot access your trolley because the database is down. You don't like it. Yeah, you, you go away and go somewhere else. So Amazon said, we must preserve availability at all costs. Our database will be always available. And then what happens when you don't have consistency? Well, maybe the system will track two um, units of the product that you want to buy. And that's okay. The system will tell you at, at the checkout when you're going to buy. And maybe you buy it, no? And then 
two pieces, and then you don't notice, and then you see those two pieces. Oh, I don't want them. And Amazon will tell you, no problem, keep them. You can keep them. You don't care. It's okay. I mean, it happened. Amazon is fantastic. It's very, very customer centric. So uh, uh, once I, I, I ordered a golden chain on Amazon, like quite expensive, and it didn't arrive. So I called Amazon, sorry, the, the golden chain order didn't arrive. Okay, I'll send you another one. Okay, sounds good. That works for me. Because they don't care about the occasional problem. Co the cost of solving that, comparing to the cost of managing consistency, really, it's not comparable. So they, they don't really, they care about the customer. If something happens, they will take care of you. So very good, and that's, uh, the, that's Amazon Dynamo. It was published in 2007, I remember, the paper. And uh, everybody was, oh, that's so cool, let's do it. And then, you know, for example, Cassandra happened, but I don't, I'm, I'm not sure they, they really read it. So they, they probably skip read, it, skip read it, so because, yeah, whatever. I'm not a Cassandra lover. And React also, no? Now, the third system are CP system. So, when you select consistency and partition tolerance, so you will always have consistency and partition tolerance, you, don't, you sacrifice availability. So in this system, it may happen that when a partition happens, a segment of the system does not work. No? But the rest will work. So out of five nodes, three will work, and two will work in read-only, or not work at all. And that's okay. That's how they work. And those are majority quorum. No? The other ones, sorry, were called the sloppy quorum. So strict quorum, sloppy quorum, majority quorum. So to make sure that the data is valid, the majority needs to, ag needs to agree. Okay? And this is Apache Zookeeper and Google Spanner, for example. Now, because we only have uh, um, 30 minutes, I will straight go to the demos because we need to be quick. So um, in this demo, we will see a key value store. No? Uh, all the data are distributed across the system. So we're going to have uh, four nodes, if I remember. Four, five, I don't remember. How many? Boo. Uh, no, not this one. We're going to have one, two, three, four nodes, yes. And, um, and uh, we're going to distribute the data on all these four nodes. So there is no sharding. So we do not separate the data sets. But they, they will be fully replicated. And what we're going to do, we're going to have a look at the code and then start killing server, partition the network, and see what happens in these three different mechanisms, OK? Three different ways. No worries, it's a simulation. If something happens on your laptop, it's not my fault. That, that, this will run on my machine, okay? Completely isolated, I don't have internet, Wi-Fi, nothing. So, yeah. Now, um, in terms of uh, structure of this, oops, sorry. In terms of structure of this, we have, this is the overall design. You will go, you, I, the slide will be available. This is overall design anyway. So we have uh, get, and set the API on top in the storage API, the blue corner on top. So I can get a value and set given a, given a key, and set a value given a key, OK? And then this goes to the storage. This is managed by the protocol, APCP, that those three different protocols. And the protocol will store the data on the database or will interact with some specific protocol stuff. And the protocol itself will have some API. So now we're going to look first is uh, CA, so classic RDMS. And we're going to look at a simple implementation of uh, two-phase comet. Don't worry, it's easy. It's really easy. No? And this is classic RDMS, so strict quorum. Every node has to agree. Okay. Um, now, let's have a look at the code first. So this is, oops, this is overall how it works. So in terms of infrastructure, the two-phase comet protocol has how does it work? Somebody wants to set a value, it will propose a value to everybody, and then you will receive, okay, 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 okay. When everybody has answered, you will say, okay, commit, and everybody will commit. And if something goes wrong, roll back, and everybody will roll back, okay? That is how it works. It's not complicated. Of course, it's a transaction log uh, before going to the data store, but that's all details. We don't care about that. Um, right, now, oh, sorry. Let's go to the code one second first. Now, the code is on GitHub, and uh, the main uh, thing is this server here. Can you read it? Yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. So you have this, this code. They have, they have a couple of uh, endpoints to dump the, the, data, the database content and to 
clean the database content. The database, so clean the screen. The database is just a key value store, so it varies the structure. And then we have this, the, oops, no, I want to change it. The get and the post to set and get a, a value is using Express, so very easy framework. And, you know, that start listening, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what else? So we have, for example, here uh, the, the store mechanism. So uh, whenever you do a get and a set, what do I go? You know, when I receive a get call, I'm calling the store. And the store is specific for each implementation. So we have three different implementation, AC, AP, uh, this is a little bit small, but uh, and CP. Those are three different implementations. So we start with IC. So we go here and we say, OK, IC. OK. And then the sister will magically restart. So that's where we are. So we have one, two, three, four nodes. OK. And the main window here is the controller. So I can go, uh, for example, I can, I can do this. Everything is cleaned. And then I can do, oh, sorry, I, I ruined your, your picture. And <laughs> do, do you want wait, let me do wait, wait, let me do it again. Wait, okay, let's do this so that they will start. Uh, yeah, we go better. Uh, colorful, red, green, all this stuff. No, um, we can we can literally start. So let's let's start to set a value. So I have uh, the, those scripts are also in the in the repository. So I'm, I'm set a value here. No, and you know what happened? I talk with this guy here. And this guy here launched a proposal to all the other three guys. And the three guys said, OK, we like it. We like this proposal. Let's, let's go forward. And then you see here, so I mean, I'm here, you can see the proposal results. Oh, sorry, there's a bit. Can I move this a bit? Here we go. So sorry. Yeah. I didn't notice. So you can see here the proposal results, though, 200, 200, 200. Then, OK, I'm sending the commit to the peers, 200, 200, 200. All good. No? You notice one thing. This guy over there is a slow guy. No? L look what I do when I, when I did a set value. Hope. All the three guys downstairs already did it. The guys up didn't. Oop. <coughs> So a single slow node will slow your whole database. And this is the problem when you use strict quorum protocols. A single misbehavior will cause you problems. And of course, if you kill any node, like Ole, ciao, ciao, you kill this one, then it will fail. I'm not able to get an answer from one of the node, and I'm not operating. So your database is down. And the same happens. Let's restart the guy. And uh, the same happens if, uh, if, for example, I partition the node. I'm using EP tables here. So I'm going to partition. Uh, I'm against the central guy for some reason. I don't know. I always kill that guy. So <laughs> I'm going to partition that one. All right. I'm oh, sorry. The is SSH here. Oh, I'm so old fashioned. So I put extensions. Um, right. I just partitioned that guy. So now if I try to talk to these guys, so you see, that guy doesn't answer. Because now his network is completely isolated using IP tables. It's a firewall that is contained in Linux. Very easy to use. Uh, if I can use it, it's easy. No, trust me. So, um, so when I try to do something again, you know, nothing works. So oh my god, time out, time out. You see, I tried to reach that guy, and I got a timeout. So nothing happened. So what I'm going to do. If I'm, if one single partition happens, your system stops working. So I can unfreeze it now. Let's unfreeze, unfreeze. And now what's going to happen is 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 funny because this node in the center, if everything goes to plan, will start receiving no now the proposal. And you know the network is a bitch. Sorry, because because also it doesn't get you the the the, the packet in order. And sometimes you can get packet in different orders, so it all gets confused. And this may possibly misbe misbehave. I mean, it doesn't because it has a two-phase commit protocol. But if it was a simple protocol, then it could misbehave because you receive packet in the wrong order, and everything goes tits up. All right? But yeah, and now everything works. You got this one? Yes? Almost? Kind of? OK, cool. Remember, all the data, uh, all this source is on GitHub. And you can access it and see it. And you can also run it like I'm running it. 
I'm just using screen here, which is a Linux utility to show different consoles in a different screen. Like you can use Tmax or just do whatever you want, man. Um, now, <coughs> let's go back to the other version. The other version is AP. In AP, we have this concept of, well, they're called sloppy quorums. Well, don't tell the Cassandra guys, but yeah, that's how they're called, sloppy quorums. So you really don't need a majority. You need, you need some, you know, some agreement. And it's one of the things that you want to change when you first install Cassandra, because I don't, I don't remember now, in the latest version, maybe they did it. In the initial version, if one node agree, that's OK. Out of 20 nodes, one agrees, yeah, uh, it's there. It, it's not. <laughs> now, you want to have a more solid agreement, right? And React, for example, does a better job to that. And how this thing works is that um, basically whenever you write, you send the message, and then as long as you receive enough confirmations, you say, okay, that's good for me, and you don't care about the rest. No? Even if they are still processing it, that's fine. And the problem is what happens when you have an inconsistency in this situation? Well, where there is the, the, the smart, if you want, version of it, so that there will be a mechanism to resubmit missing data in the transaction log. So if when I read, I will return immediately the results to somebody, to anybody who asked me to read. But I will also check if the read was consistent. So if the read was consistent, then no, uh, it's all good. But if I find an inconsistency, I will try to you know, repair it and fix it on the way. Okay. Now, having a look at the code, um, so the same thing I have to change here instead of AC, I put CP. Yeah, I'm using Nodemon here, which is an automatic reloading mechanism from Node.js. So whenever you change the code, it reloads it, and it's so good. So now we have, oh no, this, what, oh no, sorry, use uh, uh, CP, oh sorry, I was doing EPI, sorry. Don't look at it, don't look at it. Uh, Clean, clean, clean. Ah, OK, got it. <laughs> they were starting electing people, just to complicate. We're going to see it later. Uh, so here we go. So this is uh, how it works. So this, the store of this guy, just to see how the store is working. Remember, the API, I receive a get. I call store dot, uh, uh, get load or store.save. So the save here, no? Um, let me get the right one, maybe. Uh, the store here has two uh, functions. The sloppy write. So the sloppy write will send uh, uh, a write request and then just account for some answers. So maybe two answers are enough. Three answers are enough. No? And I will proceed. And the smart read, the other function here, will, will basically uh, whenever he reads something and he finds an inconsistency, it will fix the inconsistency to the nodes that have it. Okay? Let's see it in action. It's easy, but basically I probably have a diagram here. Um, so just to come back to this, this is an eventually consistent design. So eventually the database will consist because at a certain point in time we'll have all the data that we want. But sometimes you can get you, you may get unlucky, eh? especially on you know, Cassandra, very unlucky. Um, <laughs> and yeah, Dynamo, React, Cassandra, they're all using this sloppy core mechanism. And you know, this, this is the infrastructure is slightly the same. I also used here a two-phase commit. I already built it for the other one. I just used it again. You know, I'm a cheap guy. Uh, yeah, what can I say? And, um, and there are two additional API there, read and repair. And the repair is the API that will be used when I, when during the read, I notice that something is not working. I will repair the nodes that are not behaving. Okay. All right. So let's see it in code, which is easier. So in demo, this is the demo. So as you can see, da da da, AP mode, sloppy quorum. You can see there we are in sloppy quorum mode, and um, and we still have this low guy over there. So when we are in sloppy quorum, there's no problem if you have a slow guy. Because you just need some, some answers. So if I ask for a value, let's set a value. No? You see, it's super fast. We didn't, we didn't wait for the sloppy guy, for the slow guy, sorry. Let me, let me see, let me show you if I read it. 
No? Okay, I don't find the entry. So I read it. Snap. Done. Okay? And then the other guy will answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you told me. Yeah, sure. You know. <laughs> no? Because as long as we have enough answer, so we have a, in read, we have a quorum of two responses. So as long as we have two responses, that's fine. We are good to go. Okay? So for that reason, this is very fast. So and even in this situation, even if I kill a node, like bye bye, um, it still work, and it still work, uh, you know, uh, okay, even if we need to wait for the slow guy. So if I in in write, I think I remember the write quorum that I have. Um, well, the write quorum is oh three. That's too much. Yeah. But anyway, even if I kill this guy, it will work. Here we go. Yay, everything is working. Yay. No, no problem. And because, and we don't have to, you know, s have any, you know, strange situation. Apart from when this guy comes up again. So when this guy comes up again, the way that I stopped, no? I started up again. So let's, let's see what's the database situation here. So this is the database. Oh, let's clean it for a second. Clean. No. This is the database situation. So we have this value and the city is the key and the value is London in 2016. Every time I write something, <coughs> uh, that value changes. is a magical random function. Uh, incredible. Uh, so now it's 2069. Um, <laughs> you notice another thing in a database. There is always that TS. That stands for timestamp. This is also used in, uh, sorry, I believe in, this, in collisions. So whenever we have a collision between two values, we can look at the timestamps and get a reasonable you know, uh, hint about what's the good one. It's not implemented in mine, so sorry. But I just wanted to show that this exists and it's used. right? So this is the database we have now. So if I run this guy now, here we go. Come on. No, this guy, not your. Here we go. And I ask for database again. Yeah. Oh, no. Backtick. I hate backticks. Why do I have that backticks? I have backticks. Why did they use backticks? All right. Anyway, this is the database situation. You know, uh, the the three guys there have an up-to-date value, and this one guy has nothing. What's going to happen? So when I'm going to read, there will be the famous uh, repair mechanism if it works, of course. Well, hopefully it will. I tried yesterday. So if I get the value, no, I will ask this guy here. No, I will get the value, and what happens? You see. The first answer that he gets, it's inconclusive. So he gets, OK, I get 200 for one, so there is a value. And the other guy tells me there is no value. What's, what's going on? I cannot give back an answer to my clients. All right? So what's going to happen is that here, no, we go, it's going to wait for another answer. And then at the point, oh, look, we have two good ones and one bad. But our quorum is two. So I'm sure that those guys in agreement, then I can conclude that that's the right value. And then I will send a repair. No? You saw there, disagreement to process one, repairing to 2003. That's the guy over there. So that guy will send that guy a repair, uh, a repair uh, command, and the database will be realigned. OK? It's all magic. So if I now dump the database, <whistles> magic, all done. That's how it works. And the same happens if I freeze it. So if I can do the usual uh, freeze uh, or the network, um, it's exactly the same. Because I, I can freeze this guy in the center. No? And then I can set a value. No? You see, this guy doesn't react because it's the, the network has been partitioned. This guy doesn't receive anything. And then if I unfreeze it, and then I continue, maybe I say another value, another value, another value. You see, eventually, this guy concludes the timeout because he cannot reach that one. So if I now I freeze it, if I find the command, or we leave it freeze forever. No, we want, we want to unfreeze it. Come on, pull guy. Um, and then we do a read. No? Everything will be realigned magically. No? Because, again, this guy sees an inconclusive answer. So I received two 200s, but they're different values. I don't know what to do with it. Why? Because this guy has an old value, right? And then at the end, 
when it detects, okay, there is a quorum, the value is this one, it repairs the guy. So now the databases are aligned again. Magic. Cool? You got it? You sleepy? No? Most, almost. Okay, let's go to the third mode, which is quite interesting also. The third mode is about um, CP. So it uses a majority. It's like an elect. It's like it's lit literally there is an election. There is a leader. So rather than than waiting for this, this number of agreement, there is a leader elected. So a leader gets elected, and then you always talk to the leader, and the leader will uh, coordinate the uh, the talk with all the nodes, and the leader will continuously talk to all the nodes using uh, well. Now we're talking about Raft. There are different implementations of this pro of the um, majority consensus protocol. And Paxos is the most famous, but it's super complicated. I didn't manage to do it, sorry. But I did a kind of Raft that, again, it's in the code. And Raft is still a majority consensus protocol. So I um, send a request uh, to the leader. The leader will coordinate and then get back with an answer. And the leader in Raft continuously talks with the other guys in the, in the cluster, continuously tick them. It has a bit, and all the communication happens during the bit. So how does it happen that a leader suddenly appears in the cluster? The leader appears through an election. So there is literally an election. So we're going to have you know, people voting, yeah, I want to be leader, I want to be leader, and of course they start voting by themselves, you know, like Italians, you know, vote for myself. <laughs> I'm the best leader ever, no? And then, but uh, everybody will vote for himself in the first row, but then eventually they start voting for each other and the leader will be elected, no? Uh, apparently not every node is Italian, that's fine. And uh, let's go back and see that in action. So I have to go back here and put in CP mode. No, ACP, I don't have it, it doesn't exist, sorry. And in CP mode, you see, um, we, I, these guys already elected, oh, they already did it, oh, they were fast. Okay, they already elected a leader. So, and the leader, oh, the leader is a sloppy guy. So th there was a voting uh, mechanism going on, and the sloppy guy was elected, so the slow guy, it's not sloppy, just slow. The slow guy was elected. So now, every communication that I do will be go through this guy. It's gonna be too slow, let's kill it, ciao. So, because I kill it, another leader will be elected, Hopefully, yeah, we go, another leader. So, ah, a good one. Okay, let's restart this one. Yeah. That's too slow anyway, come on. And, uh, you know, how does it work? You see, the leader, the leader sends a beat. So, you see that tick, 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 tick? Well, it's lower than that. Actually, it's quite fast. It's just that I made it very slow to show you it here, right? So, the leader sends tick to everybody, no? And there is this concept uh, of uh, a term. So you need, you see there, term two, because there have been, been two elections. Every time there is an election, the term also increases. So let me see, let me show you something. When I, say, when I save a data, no, with this model, right? So let's go through the details uh, how it works. But now, there are more information in the database. There is the term and the ticked. So every data is associated to the term, when it was set, and the tick when it was set. So it's a unique key that plays in a temporal line where the data happened. And again, any uh, disagreement can be sorted using that. Okay? Now, how the write works, let me show you again because it was I didn't show anything really. Uh, <laughs> um, now, when I do, I set a value, I will talk to the leader here. The leader will propagate my request to the after in the next bit to all the followers. And after that, it will if I receive a consistent re uh, response, then you will have a final value. All right? So let me show you. Here we go. So here, you see, I, s I talk to this guy, which is also a leader in this situation, and the leader has sent this propagate that information during the next bit. You see? It's all propagated to all the other guys. So all the guys are updated now. And if I do a dump, everybody has the same value. Now, what happens when uh, one of these guys dies or is partitioned? 
So let's kill the leader again. No, I know, I like, no, I like this one. I want to kill another one. Sorry, let's kill this one. I keep killing leaders, I don't know. I just, it's just me, really, sorry. I mean, just me. Now, uh, the leader is over there. Cool, so we have a leader. And uh, the term is four, and the tick is 11. So if I now send a val uh, set value, everything will work because we have a majority. So three nodes out of four is a majority, and it's cool. We can deal with that. Actually, the leader is not involved, so it's three nodes, it's two nodes out of three. No? It's okay. I can probably kill this one as well. Oh my god. Oh, everybody, everybody's dying here. Oh no. So, you know, still works. It's all good. Still continue to work. Because we still have a majority. So in the occasion that the network is partitioned or part of your cluster goes down, everything works. When it, this guy goes up, no? For example, you see, it will instantly be recognized by the leader. And the leader will sell him, send him an update. As soon as this guy goes up, the leader will, th this guy will receive a bit. And he say, oh, there is a leader. Oh, oh, please get me the transaction log so far. And the leader will send the transaction log since the time the guy was down. Now, if I see the database now, perfectly fine. And the same I can do here. Now, let's start the guy again. You see, immediately, you see, asking history from term zero and tick zero. That's when he started. So he was, I don't know, I've just started, my term is zero, and you know, tick is zero, give me all the history. And the leader will send the transaction log about that. Actually, in this case, it's optimized, just send the value. And that's it, done. So what happens if I have a freeze? Same thing. So let's freeze. I don't know why I'm against the center one, I don't know. Oh my god, I really hate it. Now, I, I froze that one, no? Look what happens. So after I froze that one, no? Oh my God, it's just, oh my God, there's no leader. Let's, let's elect somebody, myself. And he's trying to elect himself, but it's difficult because nobody's giving uh, a flying uh, uh, fart about that. I was using a different word, but flying fart I can use. Um, so this guy is trying to get elected, and yay, yay, I'm the best, elect me as a leader. But because it's partitioned, the network is completely gone. So that side of the network is completely isolated. He cannot talk to the others. The others, you see, they're still working. They don't give a crap about that. So if I, <laughs> if I, I, can, I can, you know, interrogate them, and, you know, I can send a new value to them, you know, and I can set a value, uh, and everything works. Uh, hopefully, and uh, I can get the database dump here. All good. The only guy is here trying to be elected. So now what happens? If, if we unfreeze the network, notice one thing. This is already in term, I don't know, in term four or something. No, it's going around term four. Let's, let's, let's let them go in term five or term fifth. So he's still trying electing himself, and every time he increases the terms. So he's, he's, he's in the future, basically. That really reminds me of Italy. Shit. I live in London, so I'm cool. So, um, so it's in the future. So that, oh, term 12 now, you see, it's in term 12. So if I now unfreeze it, there we go, no? Thi this is gonna be complicated. You see, this, this received receive the history, so it's now in term four, but now it's receiving a lot of funny messages. Look at there, the tick number. That's because the network is a bitch. It will not send your packet in order. It will send it disordered in any possible way, whatever. So this guy will still receiving crap, and, but the Raft protocol is able to detect that crap using the, uh, the bit that was sent over the, uh, from, the, from the leader. You see also the other guys are receiving form requests. They don't, they don't give a, a flying fart. You know? Look, all the vote requests for 2002 are coming. You know, oh, somebody asked me to vote, buddy. I'm already in the beat, I don't care. And look at the sequence, 12, 13, 11, 8, 9, 10. Network is a bit, told you, right? So that's how this, this thing works. And, and I suggest to you that, so that's the end of the demo. We have one minute, well, 40 seconds, really. So that's how this thing works. And what I suggest to you is, you know, have a look at those things as important. Just Look at the slides and capture the basic aspects of it, of the CAP theorem. And you will, 
You will need it if you do any distributed programming. And of course, there are other things like CRDTs and uh, vector clock and a lot of other things. But this is an interesting topic. So I suggest that you look at that. To understand Raft, you can also go there and the secret live of data.com Raft. And there is a live representation in JavaScript of how Raft works, if you have any doubt. It's very, very good. You should really see it live, the server, the all the situation is very, very good. So if you have any doubt, I used it to build my Raft because at the point I didn't know what to do. I just, <laughs> I mean, you ever read a paper from a conference? It's just not for this conference, but paper by these guys, it's just, it's just a lot of gibberish, you know, what, what was he saying? You know, a lot of math. I don't understand math. Yeah, just, just code here. Anyway, and the code is there. And yeah, and then if you want to read the paper of Amazon Dynamo that every copy everybody copied from, uh, that's there. All right? Uh, again, if you have any questions, shh, we have zero minutes. But if you have any questions, you can catch me outside. But thanks again for having me. I hope that you understand something more. And I'm available for you if you have any questions. Thank you.